up at Unicorn here. It is 7.30 in the a.m. and I just want to say good morning to you and also I want to say happy Indigenous Peoples Day, happy Turkey Day, Thanksgiving, Friendsgiving, whatever you got going on, whatever you're celebrating or not celebrating. Happy that to you. I just wanted to have a little, little discussion with you about what I'm actually doing with my channel. Sometimes you see me and I'm commenting on Love and Mayor Tonsville. Other times you see me, I've got a playlist about NPD terms you should know. NPD is Narcissistic Personality Disorder. Um, some other live streams and uploads, but what am I doing? The common thread here in all of my work, no matter how different it is from one another, is a soul work that I'm trying to do in the African-American woman. Now, if you're not African-American, but you benefit from that, sister, I welcome you. That you, you may be Caribbean, you may be African, you may be indigenous, you may be Arab, Asian, like Melanesian, Fijian, Samoan, Tongan, like I welcome you to glean whatever little nuggets you can from this. Uh, African-Americans have done well, especially the women, we've done well to begin conversations that become global. So for example, when the African-American woman started talking about natural hair, you saw it spread to the UK and all these communities started you know, talking natural hair. Um, you see, we, when the African-American woman started talking colorism, you see all over India and, and Pakistan, these, these women using the same terminology and, and being an inspired by the conversation. So we are a group of people who, um, and I don't take it lightly, we are trendsetters. Um, and not in a ha-ha, look at me, I did it first, but in a way that it's like, we've been through so much that we are a group of people who all people can relate to. We are a group of people who all people can relate to. Not everyone can relate to, you know, um, the, the, the Danish or the Swedes or insert people group, but African-Americans are people who globally, nations of people find themselves being able to relate in one way or another. Um, so I welcome that. Uh, as long as you are citing your sources, I wouldn't count that as plagiarism or cultural appropriation because in reality, so much of what the African-American deals with, the world has it yet to come. So African-Americans deal with a lot of stuff first and then it spreads throughout the rest of the world based on colonialism and you know who has that kind of power. So when I say I'm trying to do a soul work in African-American women, what I'm trying to undo is that colonial hangover of self-hatred, okay? That's my shtick. Like that's, that's a thing that I have always been anti since I was a child. When I look at black women and they hate their skin color or they hate their hair or they hate, you know, something else that makes them powerfully and uniquely them. Somebody say fearfully and wonderfully made. Somebody who has read the Bible say fearfully and wonderfully made because that never made sense to me until I saw the black woman in her true light. Now, uh, there's a man, rest in peace, uh, Alfredo Bowman, who was known as Dr. Sebi. And I followed him in the last three to four months of his life. His voice rang out throughout um, my household. Whenever someone caught me on YouTube, they heard his voice. And when he passed away, it was like my entire household lost somebody because they were so used to hearing his voice every day in the morning, in the evening, in the afternoons. They were so used to it. And I was copying down Dr. Sebi's uh, recipes, you know, things that he gave to people at his Usha village. Um, and some of these things I have memorized, some of these things I still have my list, but he was curing different diseases in people, things that caused people to feel bad about themselves, you know, herpes and HIV and, and whatever else, things we were told that aren't healable, but in reality, you cleanse the mucus in your body, you can press the reset button on anything. Most illnesses and diseases in the body are nothing but mucus. Even a tumor is nothing but a collection of hardened mucus. Now, Dr. Sebi said, I do this 
in the name of the black woman. I worship the black woman. The black woman is God. And when I fasted, he said, and, and, and when the muck and the things started to run out of my body, I saw her. I saw her. He had some kind of uh, apparition or of um, a naked black woman in a forest. And she was hiding, but every now and then she would peep out and look at him. Now peep this. Lisa left I Lopez, rest in peace to her and, and the doctor, Sebi. Um, she went on a fast of CMOS and, and Usha bitters for, uh, I believe it was 60 days. And one time she did it for 40 days and she reset herself. Dr. Sebi cured her alcoholism. Uh, she didn't just like to drink, she was an alcoholic. And she also had herpes and didn't tell anybody. But when he cured it, she was just like, you cured something else in me that I was too ashamed to, to talk about. And then, you know, she let that cat out the bag. But one time she came to Dr. Sebi's uh, home in Honduras while she was at Usha Village and she knocked on that door, bang, bang, bang. And she brought him a Sima smoothie and she had one for herself. And he opens the door and he says, did you see her? Lisa left I Lopez says, I saw her. He knew that with the renewing of her mind and with the curing of her illness, that she would see the same naked black woman that he saw. He didn't even have to describe for her what the setting would be or what she would be, but they had the same kind of vision, the same kind of hallucination or apparition. They saw the same thing and he knew she would. And he said, all of my striving, all of my working, whenever people would call Dr. Sebi a lie and a quack, he would say, I would never do that to my mother. I would never do that to my grandmother. What do I look like making a fool out of them by, by being a perpetrator, by being a faker, right? So many people say that, you know, oh, the black woman is God and this and this and this. But when you're talking an actual pro-black like Dr. Sebi, that's sincere for some people. And it's not to be sacrilegious towards Abrahamic faiths. It's that when you recognize the black woman and who she actually is, it hits you so hard. I mean, you turn around and you see white and Asian hoteps and it's just like, what happened? The reality of the black woman hit me too hard and I ain't been right ever since. Sorry. You know, and Connor is just onked out. So... A lot of black women, a lot of us, and it's not our fault. A lot of us don't know who we are. And there are people who know who we are and they're blown away. They're never the same. My purpose with this channel is to blow you away with who you are and to give you the most sound knowledge of self and the most radical radical knowledge of self and the most self-loving knowledge of self that you can gain. And one of the biggest enemies to that is, is pick me culture. And of course the word pick me originated in the African-American community because no one has done pick me to a more toxic degree than the African-American woman. Nobody, nobody, nobody. You could argue that, you know, the, the palm colored American woman of colonial descent has done it worse but even in her striving to be a pick me and, and riding with colonialism and racism with supremacy, you have a person who never did it to their own detriment. A lot of, you know, the colonizers uh, uh, missions was in the name of her, was in her name, was in the name of her purity, was in the name of her vagina, was in the name of protecting her private parts from non-white men and, and whatever, whatever. Even during her oppression, even doing, during her worst pick-me era, right? During chattel slavery and, and, and reconstruction and segregation and Jim Crow, right? Even in her worst era, she was still being put on a pedestal. Black women have known this, no such thing. Black women have known no such thing. The unambiguously black woman has known no such thing in her pick me -ness. And she has chosen everyone but herself in her pick me -ness. This is why the other day we were having a conversation about Cassie. And y'all know I don't let people come for Cassie. 
Y'all know I'm not willing to do that. Beautiful biracial black woman, beautiful multiracial black woman. But her being multiracial has amplified her voice in a way that Kiki Palmer didn't get, Meg the Stallion didn't get, Kim Porter didn't get, and so many other people who are unambiguously black and dark skinned and non mixed didn't get. So many people are giving her the benefit of the doubt who never gave me. Meg the Stallion got shot. She got shot, and people weren't giving her the benefit of the doubt. But most of us have not questioned Cassie. And those of us who have, y'all y'all saw my video. I, I already came for someone in specific for doing that to her. But even though I, I rejoice in that, and that makes me happy that Cassie has been heard, I cannot deny the fact that colorism has something to do with that, even within the Black community. Racism has something to do with that, even within the Black community. Because you see that the unambiguously Black woman is never the perfect victim. It's never, oh, what was her, poor her, I pity her. It's, it's no, it's, it's probably her fault. Well, what did she do? Well, what was she wearing? Well, how did she act? You know how black women are, blah, blah, blah. Even if she's the sweetest little thing, even if she's the sweetest little thing. And the world does that to us. And we do that to ourselves because we're part of the world. But I would love to show you how to be in it and not of it. I would love to show you how not to be of that kind of mindset. I'm a person who's been in therapy a long time and a person who's read a lot of therapeutic books because I was struggling with growing up with depression and PTSD and, and all manner of uh, things, being a highly sensitive person. And I have had to glean so much knowledge just to formulate myself into a formidable person. I've had to carry so much of my pain to the promised land with me and let that transform me as a person. And I know that path because I've been on it for so long. It's like Harriet Tubman going between, mm, somebody say for Harriet, thank you, Kimberly, Nicole Foster. Um, for Harriet, man. Sometimes you got to do some stuff and you say, you know, this this is for Harriet. Sometimes you got to do some stuff and it's like, well, maybe the, the people living with me right now, maybe they can't honor my mission, but you know, this one's for Harriet. Anyhow, it's like Harriet Tubman having that path from north to south memorized, that underground railroad memorized. Like, like, like maybe she, she could or couldn't explain it to you. Maybe she had to take you herself because she knew the way and she herself became a map because she knew the way. This is something where I know the way. This is my Red Sea. This is, this is, I, I, this is my staff. <laughs> I and by the way, historically, uh, the Sea Moses parted was not the Red Sea, but you know, we'll just we'll let that slide. Um, but I know the way, and one of the number one things that I want to do is I want to sever that pick me from the African American female psyche. I didn't say I wanted to sever your love for your man, your loyalty to your man, I didn't say I wanted to sever a good home or a good marriage, I didn't. Say Say, I wanted to come for love because there's nothing like love. And damn it, let me tell you, if life is a game, love is the prize. If life is a game, love is the prize. If life is a game, love is the prize. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like love. And I say that to you as a widow. There's nothing like love. Mr. Uppity loved me down. You know that uh, one plus one, Beyonce said, and you got enough for the both of us? Yeah, that, that was Mr. Uppity. Just just love me crazy. I never saw the fullness of love from a man and, until Mr. Uppity changed my soul, let alone my life and my world. So don't... Don't misunderstand me and don't accidentally or purposefully superimpose intentions onto my words when I say 
I want to slay that pick me. Because instead of screaming, pick me, pick me, I want you to choose yourself because you're working with a lot of power, black woman. And you'll notice there's a trend where now everybody's trying to kiss your ass all over the place. Now people want to say, oh, thank you, black woman. Thank you, black woman, because it was a thankless job before, or wasn't it? Because we were all pygmies. We were all pygmies. And that and being a pick me is a thankless job. You pay that man's bill. He drives your car all day. He brings your car back on empty. He eats up your kids' fruit snacks and Capri Suns and lays on your couch that you just cleaned up and, and you just beat the pillows and put your house together. He funks up the bathroom after you just got done lighting your incense, making everything smell so damn good. And there's not a thank you. There's just, well, I'm a man and I have, you know, I have a scrotum sack, so you have to serve me. You were created as a help meet. They don't even say meet. They say you were created as a help mate. Like like you're a playmate who's supposed, supposed to serve and all they do is denigrate you. I was just having a conversation the other day about how sex workers are always complaining about black men. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said the S word because that can be censored on YouTube but how ex workers are always talking about the the worst kind of men to be in service to in their, in their, in their field is our brother, the way he has a need to, to subjugate and abuse you and to ditty you. African American women, I need you to understand that we're part of that problem because we love our sons, but we raise our daughters. We, we love and we coddle those boys into nothing and we tell them they deserve even more, even more, even more. And we look at our girls and we say, well, you got to be smart and and you don't be no fast tail girl. And you're I know you're 10, but how dare you seduce that grown man? And and you're you this and you that and you need to read a book and you need to go to college and you need to get a job because a man might leave you. But we don't lecture our boys like that. We don't say a woman might leave you. You need to learn how to cook and clean and sew. We raise our black girls to survive the damn hunger games. But with our boys, it's, you know, we're, we're fanning them off with, with feathers and, 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 and putting their feet up on the, on the dining room table and, and feeding them and bringing them food and coddling. And we're totally bypassing their need for crossing the burning sands from boyhood into manhood. We're totally missing somebody tossing them the baton of manhood and we have these grown ass little boys. We have we have an epidemic of, of grown ass little boys, grown men with little boy tastes, looking for mama and every woman. Now, I don't say, I'm, I'm not like some of these other channels who say, well, they need to change, change them, change them. Who cares? Change you, right? Because you're the only person you have power over. You're the only person you can do something like that about. Like, do they need to change? Sure. Yes. The answer is yes. You got it. The answer is yes. But what can you honestly do? You think sitting on a manosphere panel yelling at them is going to change them? You think being kind to them and being sugary sweet is going to change them? Oh, maybe I better start respecting black women because this one's nice. No, they'll just create a new category for you and call you a unicorn. How do you think I got my name? They'll just create a new category for you and diss the rest of your sisters and diss your mother and diss your aunt and diss your daughter and diss your niece, your whole tribe, your whole tribe of every woman who makes you you. So what about if we planted something new on you? And let the anti pick me take root in you. Where you love yourself so much, you're not trying to be, you're not trying to be picked and begging to be picked, but rather you have a slew of men to pick from if you want them. 
you have a slew of suitors to pick from if you want them. And can I tell you something, honestly, sincere self-esteem and confidence is the winning key. And here's the deal. I can be generous with that information. I don't have to gatekeep that information because I know good and damn well, sincere confidence and self-love, that is hard to come by. So many people fake it. So many people fake it. I remember when Jay-Z didn't love himself, he used to wear all manner of jewels and, and always just, just, just lavish, ridiculous things. When Jay-Z came into self-love and came into his manhood, and hear, and hear me out, ladies, this is just an example, because I'm not trying to make you Jay-Z or whatever, but you saw his style get plainer and plainer and plainer. You saw the, the, the big gaudy jewelry disappear into something subtle, you know, a subtle black diamond necklace. He became more subtle, more subtle. Because he didn't need that to flash because he was flashing in his own eyes. He didn't need that to shine because, you know, the girl dad, Jay-Z, shines all by himself. He didn't need a low cut Caesar to show everybody, look, I have good hair. I got waves. Right. That's what he used to wear. He's like, eh. Beyonce had to say it for him. F this fade and waves. I'm going to let it dry it all up. Right. When you start to love yourself, you start to really kick it with your natural state. And please don't let me make you think that that means you have to get rid of all the weaves and all the wigs and all the clip ins. You don't. But you start to kick it with who you actually are and like it. There are signs of a person who has self-love. And so many of us don't have it. It's crazy. So many of us are walking around here with void and vacant self-esteem. And that's not uh, a term I created. That is a term by Dr. Joy DeGore Leary. Remember, I told you, I read the doctors. I read the doctors. I, I pay attention to what they have to say. There is an endless kind of suffering that is low self-esteem. There's an endless kind of suffering that is self-rejection. And I want to eliminate that. So with much of what I say on my channel, with much of what I do with my channel, it really boils down to making sure the African-American woman loves herself and teaching her how if she doesn't know how. I had a video the other day where I was talking about how African-American women, the way that you are, not just your name and reputation, but the way that we are, makes us desirable to so many men around the world. And none of us believe it until we travel. All our brothers will be like, oh, those men only fetishize you. They don't want you. They don't want you. They don't want you. And if you travel enough, you see these African-American women, they're married all over the world to men in their respective countries, to Arabs and Africans and Asians, wherever they are, because there's something about your way, about the way you have been bent and contorted into such a dope woman. That most women are not on that type of time. They're like, be all that for what? What do I look like? Supergirl? I need a break. Soft life. Ew. Nah, black girl, you do too much. Like you blow people's minds because you are too much. You're the mosties. Yeah, we stay doing the most. And the thing is, you don't have to. So lay your burden down. You don't have to, so lay your burden down. I know there's a brother who taught you that you have to. I know there's a hotel who taught you that you have to, who taught you that you were worthless unless you're get unless you're cooking and cleaning and slaving and paying. But you don't have to. So lay your burden down. I know your back hurt. Your back hurt from carrying the culture. Your back hurt from carrying the accountability. Your back hurt from carrying his mistakes. Your back hurt for carrying what it is to be a pick me. You have to break yourself to be a pick me. You know who the pick me auntie is? The pick me auntie who maybe she, you know, maybe she's not in high school betraying her friends anymore over some musty little boy that don't even really like her, right? Because pick me's like to do that. They love to betray their girlfriends over a little boy, some musty man that don't even like them. 
The pick me auntie says, shame on you, you fast tail little girl. What were you doing wearing that? No wonder he touched you. That's the pick me auntie. That's the auntie that says, don't you go out of this house talking about your uncle George. Don't you leave this house telling people he did this and this and this to you when you were a willing participant. Hey, keep that to yourself. Don't tear the family apart. You're the reason nobody wants to get together on holidays anymore. No, he's the reason, and that's the proper thinking. He was the one in the wrong. He was the one who ruined his reputation. He's the one who was willing to ruin a child and his reputation. So F him, not me. I stay, he goes. That's how it's supposed to be. But it's not like that, is it? And some of you have family stories about how it's not like that. About how you had to be quiet and how you couldn't say anything and how you couldn't protest against this, against this man because you were raised in a family of pygmies. Now, here's the deal. The women have the actual power of family. That's our infinity stone. Because if we don't cook and if we don't clean and if we don't make the house a comely place to be during the holidays, then it ain't going to happen. We have that power to bring all those people into one household. And we can say no to a specific person or a whole group of people. But we turned it over. We turned it over. Part of the reason I go so hard, hard on Kimmy Grant Scott from Love and Marriage Huntsville is because I see a woman w with the power of, of, a, of a demigod. I mean, Kimmy has so much talent when it comes to African-American womanhood, her brain, her beauty, her, her comprehension. And she just tosses it at the feet of a man who doesn't care. She's a, she's a flaming pygmy. The song Cozy could be about Kimmy when it's like, oh, she's a god, she's a hero, she survived what she's been through, confident, damn, she lethal. All of that could be about her. But she sacrifices her greatness to be mid for some mediocre ass, like underachieving ass, you have to carry him to the promised line ass man. And she subjugates all that she is, all the beauty that she is, all what she has. There are some black women, they don't have all that Kimmy has. You know how hard it is to be a nurse? I know you see nurses everywhere and you think that it's easy, but when you get to some of those math classes and some of those conversions, those medical conversions that they have to do, that stuff is hard. And a lot of people will flunk at that point. Kimmy's got a mind on her. And when Kimmy wants to, she's got integrity and she's only not got integrity when she's scottified, and I'm like the, the goddess within you that you shackle, bro. That is not only self-betrayal, that is betrayal to black woman. And there are so many black women who don't have access to the personal power that Kimmy has. Kimmy's a, a, a I was going to call her a gold mine, but she's more like the cobalt in the Congo. Her inner her is cobalt. And she's turned herself into the people of the Congo who are mining that cobalt for oppressors. She's mining her inner cobalt for Maurice. And it'd be one thing if you were, you know, sharing yourself with someone who deserves it. Sharing yourself with somebody who kisses your feet and who carries you across the threshold and who makes sure you don't do anything but lay on your back without having to roll over and suffer through it, you know, but while you're, while you're fighting, you know, um, stage four scorpion Pisces cancer, it's like, no, I'm going to take care of you. Don't move. Just, just breathe, eat, sleep. Breathe. That's all you need to do until it's done. If it was that kind of man, I could see. But even then, I'm anti-build a man. I am. I'm not here for w women building men. I'm not. 
that was his mama and daddy's responsibility. And if they failed, then it's his all on his own. And I recommend men every time. If, if you're not a man, if you know you're not a man and you don't have a dad or an uncle to pass that mantle of manhood, go pledge. Go, go, go to college and decide you want to be an Omega. Go pledge. You, you, you need some men around you to do that for you because it's not a woman's job to do that for you. And you suck her dry when you do. You suck her dry when you do. You deplete her when you do. It's always a man. People try to say that this whole Diddy Cassie thing is like, oh, well, he's wealthy. He's wealthy. No, there are plenty of men, low level men, level less men, no level men who are out here sucking the life out of women so they can look like something. And then when they go home, they're not even attracted to her because they already sucked the life out of her. So they go and they find some Ariane dingbat that they that they can't suck from because she's got nothing to offer. And they say, ah, there's my queen. There's my repose. There's my respite. There's my oasis. And you're at home sacrificing yourself. You're at home on on a on an altar of your creating, with, with a knife in your hand, at your own neck, slaughtering yourself, putting your lifeblood into this man who doesn't deserve it. You were never made to do that. You lose blood already creating a child, get, delivering a child. You were never created to do that for a man, but you do that because you're a pick me, and you do that because you're dying to be chosen. And because you 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 want it, and you want to be chosen by men who don't want to choose you, that's another thing. A lot of us as, as African American women, women, we have preferences for men who don't prefer us. And all you have to do is renew your mind a little. You renew your mind a little, and you can completely change your preference. You can. You can completely reroute your preference. You can. You see, black men are not as married to the idea of black love as black women are because it's promoted towards a black woman. Black women are told you need to be with a black man. Black men, you know, they get to a certain level in life and you see what woman they choose. And don't you dare LeBron and Savannah James me. Don't you dare Jay-Z and Beyonce me. I know who they're with. But part of the reason they get the respect that they do is because they're unicorns. They're unique. It doesn't happen all that much. Don't you Denzel and Pauletta me? It doesn't happen that much. Don't you Samuel L. Jackson and his wife me that? Because you know it doesn't happen that much. You know what's really going on. You know Tristan and that Kardashian is the norm. As soon as they get some success. Because male approval is everything to them. And the men at the highest, you know, pinnacle of the of the pecking order are the colonizers. So what better than to have the woman of the colonizer on your arm to say, hey, I'm just like the colonizer. I'm a co-equal to him. A lot of men do stuff for male approval, just like a lot of women do things for women approval. You know, I stopped coming on camera because I, I've got a size H bra. Naturally, just big boobs run in my family. And years and years ago, women made me feel so bad about, you know, my low cut shirts and, and how I show up on camera, I just closed it. Most of my viewing audience was male. Today it's mostly female. And part of that was because, hey, I was seeking the approval of the woman. I'm like, well, how do I, how do, I do this in a way that is true to me, but comfortable to you? And I just got off the camera. And my thing with low cut tops, one, I like them and that's my business. Uh, but two, I look absolutely obese until you can see the difference between my where my boobs stop and where my body stops. I just look real broad and wide until that. So it kind of helps me with, you know, 
with when I'm on camera. I, I think I show more cleavage on camera than I do in my day-to-day -day life just because with the way the camera sits, the camera angle, whatever it is, I look really, really heavy without a low-cut top or something that's, or even a good bra. If I don't have on a good bra, I just, I look ill-proportioned on camera. Just a thing. Um, I've gotten to a place where I feel like my message is tried and true enough for me to return as I am and for women not to take it as personally because I know having a problem with that, if it's not coming from Islam and if it's not coming from Christianity, if it's not coming from Judy, I mean, which is all, I mean, you know, these are all patriarchal religions. If it's not coming from that, it's coming from pygmy. The fact that a woman in a low cut top could be, you know, uh, that you could target for bullying simply because it's a, a low cut top and she's busty. I'm like, oh, that comes from the pick me. And I know how to deal with her. And if you let me deal with her, I will take her out of you. That is a spirit that has possessed us. I can take her out of you. You don't necessarily need that spirit of competition with other women. And I'm not a person who's against friendly competition, emphasis on friendly competition. But pick me competition has never been friendly. It destroys friendships. It destroys sisterhood. And part of the reason you go all around these, you know, these black YouTube channels by women and you see that there's no sisterhood. Um, that's part of the reason I love the gossip girls, because they are they are sisters. OK. They don't have none of that jealousy competition. They make fun of each other. They have a good time. It's part of the reason I like their dynamic so much because they don't have to be afraid of one another. They don't have to be Shanquilla Robinson with one another, where somebody's going to take you to Cabo outside the country. And because you're the shit and you're unambiguously black and they don't know how to deal with that, me and the mixed girls who ought to be better than you are going to beat you until we eliminate you. <laughs> Because that's what really happens when you're a badass dark skin. It's one thing to be a badass mixed chick or light skin, but it's a whole nother thing when you're a badass dark skin. Because they expect a light skin girl or a mixed girl to be the prettiest girl. But when you're dark skin and you're the best thing, it's like, nope, nope, can't handle it. This jacks up my worldview. My worldview is that all of us are superior to all of you and I'm going to eliminate you. So that's no, so, so my worldview can be true. That's how that happens. That's pick me. So if I could show you how to isolate pick me, how to identify pick me and how to avoid pick me, I would love to. But the first work has to be done in you. Just like for me to have this as a as a speaking point and as a channel mission, the work had to be done first in me. I was a flaming pick me. I was a flaming patriarchy princess. And I ruined so much of my youth and so much of my life by choosing everybody over me, trying to be picked. And I'm telling you now that I choose me and I pick me and I actively pick me every day. Oh, my goodness. The roles are reversed. And I'm older and I weigh more than I ever have. When I was drop dead gorgeous, I could barely have access to the things of drop dead gorgeous because I was such a pick me. And even if people had a high estimation of me, when they found that low self esteem, they would start to esteem me as I esteemed myself. Because you teach people how to treat you. And I treated myself any kind of way. And so everybody else was willing to treat me any kind of way. I had to stop victimizing myself. I had to own the fact that I was victimizing myself, that I was abusing myself. Being this pick me. And that's what it is. And every time you see a pick me, it's like, you know, when I'm irritated with Kimmy, I'm just like, you know what, Kimmy, I don't even have to go hard on you because you go hard on yourself. And I don't have to lay one hand on you. I don't have to do nothing because Maurice will do it and you'll let him. How about that? I don't even have to get worked up because you're going to go home and you're going to get it. And that's why you're on the show saying you don't want to go home and how the most stress in your life is, is at home. 
Yeah. Because that's what being a pick me does. That's what it creates. So with all of my content and with all of the commentary that I do, I always come back to these specific themes because being a pick me isn't just bad for you. It's bad for the people around you. It's bad for the people around you. It's bad for the culture. It's the reason our little girls can't speak up and say, he touched me. It's the reason we can't wear what we want to wear. You got full nations of people who walk around topless and bottomless with only a little something, something to cover the private parts. But we look at each other and we just were ready to fight because she bad. What if you studied why she's bad and you just applied it to yourself? Okay, them, them lashes, them eyebrows, them clip-ins, bet. Okay, she wore a size eight, bet. She just like, I mean, why, why not admire and acquire? As far as I know, I made that up. Now, maybe somebody else has said that before, but I started saying that when I was 18, before I had a YouTube channel. And I'm just like, it'll never be. If I see a woman with something that I admire, it'll never be hate. It'll always be admire and acquire. You know, if I see you and you got Rapunzel flowing down your neck, I'm going to ask you, what's your hair regimen? I'm not trying to pick a fight with you so that one day I can take some scissors and cut your hair and be like, well, we were fighting with each other, trying to bury my jealousy behind something silly like I'm Letitia Scott or something. For what? For what? And when we watch these shows, this Love and Marriage Huntsville, and we see these, this Letitia Scott and this Kimmy, and we see all of this pick me. You know who's not a pick me? Kiki, <laughs> you know who transformed from a pick me into a I choose myself, I pick myself melody. And right before our eyes, she did it. She changed. And she said part of the reason she was with Martel for so long is because she didn't love herself. Oh, to fall in love with yourself. Somebody say the greatest love of all. Whitney Houston wasn't lying. My mom was not lying when she sang to me every day since I can remember because that song came out in damn, what, 84? Every day of my life that I can remember growing up, being a little kid, getting ready for school, my mom always sung that song to me. She knew I'd need it. Whitney used to say, the, learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. And she's like, and the greatest love of all is, is happening to me. What an eye-opener it is. What a beautiful thing. What a, You could cry at an altar by yourself like Melody Cherie when you fall in love with yourself. Just like we cry at these weddings and we see the love and the commitment and it's so beautiful. You can be at an altar by yourself and people could feel the same way because when that love is real, it just, it moves your heart. So I was a person who truly hated myself at the peak of my beauty. In my teens and twenties, I had self-hatred. I had no self-esteem. And I learned, I accepted and I cultivated the greatest love of all. So if you're down with that and you're down for that, let me know. And even if let's say you already have it, but you want to cultivate it in others because now you have a kid and now you have this and now there's a woman in your life, a coworker you really care about, but you know, she's like this and she's like that. And she's a pick me and you want to leave little influences on her. There's a reason Marcel separates Melody and the Fletchers from Letitia because they have the greatest love of all inside of themselves. They love themselves. And he wants to, her to keep away from that so she can continue loving him the most. So if you have that love for yourself, but you want to know how to inculcate that into other women, I'm here. And that's the channel mission here. 
And in every video, there will be something, even if it's about a random subject, there will be something that will help you to influence the people around you. It's like, hey girl, love yourself. You're the shit, you know? Life comes from you, you know? You're a creator, you're a creatrix, you know? You've got divinity, you know? There's something very special about each and every one of you. You know, we're all divinely designed uniquely. We're like snowflakes. No, no one is like the other. So people can put you in a category all they want to and say, you're this type, you're that type. But you know that you're yourself. Because love makes you know. When you truly love something, you know it. There are people out there love Beyonce's music. Honey, they know it. Because what lyrics are they finna mess up on? What mute challenge are they finna mess up on? What, 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 what they know it. Oh, I love this show. I've seen people sit down and watch the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and to watch Martin and they know every word. You're home and I'll Ashley know. Right? We, we know all the words because we love it. Loving it makes you know it. Know thyself, and to thine own self be true.